kindred friends, and welcome to the Radical Emergence podcast, where we're having conversations at the edge of transformation. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen Pierre Rich, and with me is my friend, co host, and co collaborator, Dr. Sally Adams Jones. Please check out our bios in the show notes where you will find links to our work, websites, and can find ways to connect with us. If you're not already following, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and join our mailing list so you can stay up to date on new episodes as they drop. Hello everybody, Sally here. This exciting project consists of about 26 episodes in all, dedicated to better defining and understanding transformation on all its levels of reality. That's personal, social, as well as ecological. We're gonna ask, what is transformation? Why bother? Why do we need it? And what does it feel like or look like? We'll also ask, can we induce it or perhaps accidentally block it? These are really important questions for growth. We draw not only on our hard-won life experience, we are also transdisciplinarians. So what the heck is that? Well, it means we want to understand transformation from as many lenses as possible, including formal academic disciplines and discourses, art, media, and popular culture. Importantly, we draw from our living experience. So we are experts, so to speak, but mostly in just one small but highly critical area, our own suffering and the medicines that we've both used to transform our own lives. So to this end, we've also added decades of committed practices as well as formal degrees, including specific in-depth studies in the mechanisms of transformation. Because we needed to understand this healing journey for ourselves. Does this entitle us to help others? You bet, absolutely. Because it is by sharing our stories, knowledge and direct experience that we offer sane, sober, practical tools for living on the ground of life. So welcome, strap in, hang on, and enjoy the ride as we deep dive into a universe of transformation. Hello everybody and welcome back. I cannot believe this is episode six already. We've only got 20 more to go. Jen and I are already devastated that we're a quarter of the way through because we are in our favorite topic of all time. So let's dive in again and broaden this topic. Let me just briefly say, we started with the big picture, the phenomenology of transformation. Then we narrowed that down from evolution and how constant change is the context. We narrowed it down to identity because in the human, that's what transforms. And we looked at the fractal, and iterative nature of the identity, which is fluid and constantly transforming, which is very different to how most people imagine we are, which is solid and fixed. So catch up on those episodes if this sounds large for you, um, because each show that we do, we expand and narrow the focus. And now we're coming into the human experience. We looked at the modes of transformation and the practices in episode five. So that's also an important one. Today, we're gonna look at one of the most central techniques of transformation. It's super important. There are quite a few techniques that we're gonna look at, but this is the one that has been looked at extensively in various disciplines. Uh, and it's cross paradigmatic, it's, it's interdisciplinary. So it's one of the most important ones and we're gonna talk about it today. And it's got 
various names. So I'm just gonna explain that briefly. The ancient 3000 year old practices of spirituality in the East have called it the witness consciousness. And they find that consciousness through the practice of meditation. So we're gonna open with an exploration of the spiritual lens of this quality that has been translated into a couple of domains. The other one is psychology. And in psychology, we call that conscious awareness. And in the education field, specifically adult ed, they call it the subject object transformation or split. So it's got various names, but at its basis, it's one technique and it's critical to how we transform. So let's unpack that a little bit. So the Dalai Lama, I'm just gonna quote him because we're gonna start off with a spiritual lens. Said, the mind is definitely something that can be transformed and meditation is a means to do that. So in Eastern cultures, this has been a practice for millennia and there are millions of books written about it. So it's a core practice, but it's not named often. So we're gonna look at the witness consciousness and look at how you find it. So let's just take a look at the human experience a bit. We talked about boundaries already and how the mind and the body seem to have been split in modernity with a boundary because we seem to be able to think things and feel things. And for some people, these feel like two different capacities. So there's a split. For some people, they're the same thing. Now let's look at that because this is where the object subject split occurs. I had a great master yoga teacher, uh, an authentic guru who used to say to us, men tend to think they are their thoughts and women tend to think they are their feelings. And I think this is very true. And this is something that occurred through evolution. We identify, generally speaking, as genders with one or the other capacity as a predominant way of being. So women are generally stereotyped as being more embodied and men are generally stereotyped as being more conceptual or objective and subjective. So what we're talking about is unifying these capacities, which is how we expand. So women started off in evolutionary days in the early days as being able to develop their capacity to feel, give birth and nurture. So their view was generally more internal. Whereas men evolved to be scanning the horizon, looking for danger and for prey, and their view became specialized in the external. They're the problem solvers and the protectors and providers. So our views became specialized. It still means we have the other capacity though. We never lost it, thank God. And now these days we're bringing them together. We don't so much specialize anymore with one view or the other as a gender. We're trying to learn how to do both. So let me bring this back to meditation. When we learn to meditate, we begin to turn the view inwards. So for men, this is a whole new experience, generally speaking. Women are pretty comfortable there. Not all women, that's for sure. But the view is turned inwards. So the gaze for men has to shift from the external world, the world of thoughts and problem solving, to what is going on inside. Turning it to the subjective. Then you're observing both feelings and thoughts 
all that entanglement and enmeshment going on. We're identified with our latest feeling or we're identified with our latest thoughts. Meditation means you step back from all that noise and you begin to witness both. So the object and the subject of the view or the experience begins to become an object itself. So we're no longer enmeshed in the busy noise of thoughts and feelings. We're getting a view that has a little bit of distance. That's called the witness consciousness. We're witnessing our experience with a little bit of distance. So we've turned thoughts and feelings into an object that we can begin to observe. Once we can do that, we can begin to manage those very complex waves of phenomena. And we can get that spaciousness where we can begin to disidentify with them. So this is the crux of the meditative capacity. Are we identified with our feelings and thoughts? Or are we identified with that self-reflective awareness that begins to observe those as a temporary phenomenon? It's just a temporary phenomenon. But when we're enmeshed, we begin to think that's our identity. So Jen, I know that you strongly believe that this is about identity. And so I wanna hear more about that, please, from you. That was great. I um, think you hit so many important points. Uh, one of the, as we were talking about this early on, we came up with the term locus of focus. And um, I just, it just tickled me because, um, well, I love alliterations anyway. And I just think it's such a great way to talk about this shifting identity from the world of thoughts and feelings to the observer consciousness and how important and then why we're putting it here at this point in our trajectory through the shows is because this point is really critical to all the other aspects that we're going to talk about moving forward. Um, I love how you mentioned um, that this idea of the locus of focus is discussed in a variety of disciplines. Um, it's used in sports, right? Uh, trainers, sports trainers are really interested in uh, where people are putting that locus of focus, right? Psychology, cognitive sciences, educations, education, a variety of disciplines are really interested in what influences our concentration and attention. And really, most of us have never experienced any kind of that um, teaching or training about how to pay attention to ourselves. And, um, and I think that's what this episode is all about, the real importance and necessity for all of us to take a, a, a sincere interest in our inner world. So I'd like to start out um, talking about and offering first a personal experience, my personal experiencing with the shifting of my locus of focus. So as um, someone who experienced a deep and profound amount of trauma as a kid, um, because I had so much adverse childhood experiences, I grew up um, with certain painful constructs, uh, with certain stories and identities and beliefs that I believed were me. So essentially when I had a thought, you know, I dealt with a lot of intrusive thinking um, in my life when I had a thought and it said, you know, the thought was, oh, you know, Jen, you're stupid. Well, I really believed that thought. And it was like having this internal critic all the time um, that was giving me a sense of identity out of all of this painful narrative that I was carrying. Um, and I suffered. I suffered really intensely in my own mind because of that. Um, <clears throat> so it's really difficult to live a life that is beholden to every single thought as real and true. And that's how most of us live. 
And that's how I lived for most of my life until I was in my late thirties. And as I've mentioned on the podcast before, I had a spiritual breakdown that led to a breakthrough. And that was now over 10 years ago, over a decade ago, I had a dark night of the soul. Um, I was on the verge of suicide. And, you know, looking back at it, I don't, it wasn't that I wanted to die, but I was aware that something inside of me was dying and something was dying. What happened was I experienced a dying of who I thought I was and a rebirth of myself as I am, experiencing myself as I am for the first time, like a baby, like a newborn baby. It was over the course of the summer in my backyard. And I really lost touch with the ordinary reality that I had experienced up until then. And as Sally mentioned um, in the beginning, um, it was through a really deep meditative state where I was communicating with nature. Um, the trees in my backyard became my teachers and the trees and nature taught me how to be present with myself. They were teaching me by communicating through the feedback loops that uh, we are connected to. Um, when we talk about ourselves as fields of transformation, right? There are feedback loops in that field. And so the trees um, were teaching me about the actuality of being myself. Um, if you wanna know who you are uh, in stillness, uh, ask a tree and they will tell you. Trees are amazing teachers uh, about our true nature. And as I had this experience, I had just enough exposure to the concept of what's called self-inquiry through the te teachings of Eckhart Tolle and his book, The Power of Now, it just come out. Um, but not too much experience with the idea of self-inquiry um, that I was convinced that I knew what I was doing. I was really just kind of um, making my own way through this dark night. Um, and through the teachings of the trees, I started to observe my thoughts. Um, one of my favorite teachers is Ramana Maharshi, and, and he calls this becoming aware of your I thought. And so I started asking, who am I? Who am I? Really, truly one of the most profound questions we can ever ask, our, ask ourselves. Who am I? Who is having this thought? Where does this thought come from? And I started noticing as I was doing this inquiry that there was space between my thoughts. I was following the thoughts from the point in which the thought appeared in my mind. I traced that thought back to its source, back to its, back to where, where does that thought come from? And as I walked that thought, back the line to its origin, I found space, spaciousness, a kind of neutral place that isn't the same as my ordinary thinking mind. Um, and this is what the practice of meditation or yoga is pointing us to, is the spaciousness. One of my favorite teachers is uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and, and, and he said this, he said, follow the wandering, the distraction. Find out why the mind has wandered, pursue it. Go into it fully. When the distraction is completely understood, then that particular distraction is gone. And when another comes, pursue it also. And that's exactly what I did. I kept pursuing my thoughts in this really relentless way. And in that pursuit, I started building intimacy within my own inner, my inner world, within my own mind. I started paying attention to that space between my thoughts. And the more I did that, the more obvious that space became. It was really shocking that I had never noticed that before. And after many weeks of this intense self-inquiry, that space in my, between my thoughts became more real than the thoughts themselves. And this is how my locus of focus shifted. 
I essentially turned inside out. Well, my sense of identity turned inside out because the focus of identity was no longer with that passing stream of painful thoughts. When I had the thought, oh, Jen, you know, you, you big dummy, you stupid. I was suddenly aware, oh, I'm having a thought that I'm a dummy. I'm having a thought that I'm stupid. I wasn't placing my sense of identity with that, that passing thought. And the focus of my identity became with the observer of my thoughts, with, as Sally called it, the observer consciousness of my thoughts. So through this breakdown, I became conscious of my mind. And what was so interesting was that it wasn't that something was necessarily changing about me, right? I was clearing away the illusion that had kept me bound my whole life. Like walking into a room full of cobwebs with your Swiffer duster and cleaning all those cobwebs out from my mind, right? So what we're talking about here is one of the most important practices of transformation that we can engage in, which is shifting our perspective, our locus of focus, the point of identity, where we go from being highly identified with our, with our stories, with our thoughts, our beliefs, our feelings, our identities, to an awareness of those thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and identities. And that is really what spiritual liberation is pointing to. So I wanna end here with this quick quote from Ramana Maharshi. He says, become conscious of being conscious. Say or think, I am, and add nothing to it. Be aware of the stillness that follows the I am. Sense your presence, the naked, unveiled, unclothed beingness. It is untouched by young or old, rich or poor, good or bad, or any other attribute. It is the womb, the spacious womb of all creation all form. And I love describing my deeper identity now as the spacious womb of all creation. That seems to be so much more of a healthy, rich sense of identity than those painful identity structures that ran my life for so long. All right, Sally, I'm going to pass it back to you. That is so profound, Jen. This is really the basis of all wisdom and maturity and responsibility. So I love how you said the identity shifts from being identified with what is seen to the seer or awareness of awareness. It's, it's a massive shift and your life is never the same once you find that expansive consciousness. And I also love how you described that not having that yet leads to suffering. That is the, the central teaching of the great scriptures from the East, that suffering is from misidentification with our thoughts and feelings. So this, this, this is why we call it the core mechanism of transformation. There are lots, but this is the one that people have been talking about for millennia. So I, I feel quite, um, quite humbled by trying to express this wisdom that has been around for at least 3000 years and that volumes have been written about. Um, but it literally changed my life. And so we've looked at this now through the spiritual lens, which was to call this a witness consciousness. And as I said, in adult education, someone like Robert Keegan took this teaching um, and he specifically emphasized the subject object split within us that is pretty much how we create duality for ourselves. And when that split is no longer there, we can enter what we would call non-duality. This is why it's so important. 
And someone like Ken Wilber, a great contemporary philosopher, reminded us again of these ancient teachings, and he called it boundarylessness. That that is non-duality, that the subject and object are no longer split. So what does that mean? And, and where does that reside in ourselves? And I'm going to now refer to somebody whose books have just entered the marketplace and is really important to our understanding of this, Ian McGilchrist. He's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, I'm sorry, who has focused on research in the field of the brain, the neurology of this. Um, so duality is really a product of our binary brain. And what does that mean? We do know, and he's emphasized this, Dr. McGilchrist, that we have two hemispheres in the brain. One special, just as the agendas specialized over evolution, the brain itself has specialized in its two hemispheres. And this has taken 14 billion years to occur. The left side of the brain, the locus of focus is on convergent thinking. Let's find one solution for this problem. We have predators out there and we have problems to solve. We need to keep the tribe safe. Let's problem solve. Let's get one answer for this problem and do it. It's a doing side of the brain. So it cuts reality into little parts and it focuses on the little parts and fixes them. It's the most beautiful aspect of what I would call our yang nature. And the masculine tends to specialize in that. Thank goodness, because that's how we've survived. Thank you for that. I just want to say, men are going through a hard time right now, but thank God for men. So women obviously also do this. I'm not talking about genders, but the yin and the yang. And we've tended to specialize, the locus of focus due to evolutionary pressure. So the right side of the brain, which is more yin, tends to look at the big picture. It's not so boundaried. It's more intuitive. It's more imaginative and it's more embodied. So it tends to have an internal focus as opposed to the external focus. So this is the most beautiful aspect of humanity that we get to have a binary focus, objective, subjective. Some of the most balanced, healthy people do both. When this goes wrong, it can go wrong. We can become hyper objective, which is really the pressure for modernity has made us that, that we just look at life and use it as opposed to feel life and nurture it. So hyper objectivity or hyper yang is very problematic on the planet right now. It doesn't have any feelings. I'm talking about the pathological version. It just uses and cuts up reality into resources. The hyper yin is just as problematic. If we're lost in our feelings and we believe that's who we are, we get nothing done, we're very dramatic, we can't have any agency, uh, we get lost there in the embodied drama, hyper femininity. So a healthy brain tends to come together and manage both and develop what's not there. I would actually go so far as to say that the nature of evil itself, if you wanna call it that, is hyper objectivity. It doesn't connect doesn't connect and realize that the whole system is unified. And hyper unity is also problematic. So getting a balanced brain is pretty much the message of Ian McGilchrist. And thank goodness for him. We've known this intuitively forever, but he actually did the research. <laughs> thank you. And uh, so now we can talk about the binary brain and how it creates duality. So. The object of meditation or healing the object subject split is to build that capacity within us to do both, to feel and think as well as witness. 
the feeling and the thinking. To not dissociate from the feeling through objectivity, that's no good. And to not be lost in it either, immersed and enmeshed, that's also problematic. So feeling it all, allowing the thoughts to emerge and create, but at the same time, witnessing it all and having some spaciousness. So thank you to Ken Wilber, Robert Keegan, all the great thinkers who put different names to the ancient teachings and have revived some of these thoughts. Um, and you and I, Jen, are madly in love with this process ourselves and we have our own thoughts and I'd love to hear some more from you about this. I think this is why, uh, you know, having that inner intimacy is so critical. Um, because without that, how can we moderate these, you know, splits that we're living with, um, that we've inherited, um, you know, and in, in, in an evolutionary um, um, inheritance? How do we how do we manage that? And I think that that's the beauty and exciting point we're at in our own in our evolution as a species is this capacity to have conscious awareness of our minds and develop that intimacy and and then beyond that learn to play and um, enjoy our our minds and our our identities um, so thank you for that uh, so ramana maharshi said that realization is not an acquisition of anything it's not an acquisition of anything nor is it a new faculty it is the removal of all camouflage. And I love that. So the camouflage is the world of things in people, places, identities, beliefs. Um, what Ramana is pointing to is that we can have this shift of locus of focus, a shift in the fundamental identity structure. And that it's not we're becoming something different, we're removing the illusion. So the self-awareness journey that we're talking about here um, and being that conscious moderator of these, of these different aspects of, of our inner world is, isn't about becoming something different. It's, a becoming a, it's about becoming more of who we already are. And looking back on my own journey, um, you know, I, don't, I didn't just suffer because, you know, I would have a thought and it would be painful and I would believe it. That was really painful. But I also suffered because something fundamental, something really deep down in me knew that something important was being denied, suppressed. And I didn't know exactly what that was. I, I knew I wasn't who I thought I was. I didn't know who I was. I knew I didn't uh, find myself in other people and places and things, though I tried because I was certainly a seeker um, trying to find myself and especially in relationships, right? Trying to find myself in other things outside of myself. Um, but I didn't know where to look for myself. And the irony and paradox is that um, the realization that who I was looking for, that self that I was looking for was within me all the whole time. I was under my own nose the whole time. And what was in tension, the tension within me was that that awareness was aware of itself even when I was not aware of it. And I was not in contact with it. And that was a whole other level of suffering that I experienced that was really unnameable and unspeakable. I just didn't have an awareness of it consciously. And, and so a lot of sages and spiritual teachers throughout time, as Sally has mentioned, this goes way back. All of these teachings go way back. And one of the things, themes that you'll hear about this is that when you recognize that's paradox, that you have been what you are seeking all along, when you realize it, all you can do is smile. Because how ironic that who I was seeking the whole time has been here all along. 
and that that journey of a thousand miles of looking for myself and all the people, places, and things that I did ended, ended in the same place it began within me. Ramana Maharshi said that your own realization is the greatest service you can render the world. And I often wonder and think about how our world is transforming and will transform as more of us have this shift in perception and the realization of our deeper identity. And it seems like it's happening more and more. I know in my work, I, I, I'm engaging with people almost daily who are having these shifts of locus of focus. And it used to be that this was, that spiritual realization was reserved for gurus and, you know, wise folk. But I think that is transforming right now. Um, and I think that's a necessary transformation at this point in our collective story, because I believe that our future on this planet really depends on our ability to come into conscious relationship with ourselves on the inside, building this intimacy and having an awareness of a larger identity structure than just the world of thoughts, thinking, feelings, and things. So, um, and I just want to touch on this before I give it back to you, Sally. Um, you know, it's important to point out, like, like Sally is talking about, I am both I am my thoughts, thinking, and feelings. There's nothing wrong with that. But I am also the witness consciousness of that, right? I'm both at the same time. And going back to our episode on paradox, this is why we set up um, the podcast in this way, that I can be two divergent things at once. I'm not negating the importance of stories and identities and other forms of attachment that we have in the ordinary world. It's just that I'm aware of them. I'm conscious of them. I'm not being drugged by them um, and, and not attaching to them. And when this happens, that opens the door to an immense amount of creativity and play. Because once you realize that your true nature is both the formless, untouched, pure conscious awareness of things and the world of form, then you can start to really play and move in these dimensions of self with ease and creativity rather than being anchored or fixed on either side. We are incredibly complex beings. Our complexity is undeniable. And so this really isn't, you know, it, it's, we can think of it as we started talking about it as a spiritual thing, but really what we're talking about is a practical tool on the ground of life, which is what we are really interested in this podcast. What are the practical tools and modes of transformation? And in this case, we're looking to instigate transformation, not always just on the meditation cushion, but actually in the everyday chaos and mud of life. We wanna use our ordinary daily um, experiences as the opportunities to deepen into ourselves. And I'll just end with this. Uh, Jidu Krishnamurti said, the soil in which the meditative mind can begin is the soil of everyday life. The strife, the pain, and the fleeting joy. It must begin there and bring order and from there move endlessly. But if you are concerned only with making order, then that very order will bring about its own limitation and the mind will be its own prisoner. In all this movement, you must somehow begin from the other end, from the other shore and not always be concerned with this shore or how to cross the river. You must take the plunge into the water, not knowing how to swim. All right, Sally, I'm gonna pass yeah. it back to you. Jen, I love the way that you describe how you're beginning to meet all these people who are doing this. And I'm loving that because we're noticing our culture is shifting dramatically. It's transforming. So what is going on? 
this amazing ability that's coming online at the cutting edge of evolution, which we represent all of us together, we're changing and shifting, is this new ability to integrate opposites. So modernity or the old ways of being devalued the subjective. Um, it felt to know something properly and to get truth was to desubjectify everything. But that's amazing. We developed science and thank God for science. Nothing wrong with that. Um, whereas more indigenous cultures believe that to know something is to personify it. That is a deep wisdom that we lost due to modernity, but it has its own gift. So not all cultures believe in desubjectifying as the only value. We need both. So for example, animism and shamanism, you need to get inside the spirit of a being to truly know its perspective. And we need to resurrect that capacity. So we're looking at bringing the best of all these cultures and genders together. This is the new integration. And as you said, Jen, we, you and I move in these communities that are really doing it and it's fabulous. A very simple way to look at this is to notice pronouns. Are we looking at something, calling it it or its, or are we using the I or we pronoun from the inside? So someone like Ken Wilbur pointed out with, he drew this beautiful map of the four quadrants, which includes all the pronouns. I, it, we, and its. And if we can do that <laughs> with anything, we have a multi-perspectival view of the thing. So for example, let's just keep this simple. Look at the sciences and the arts. They've specialized the sciences and thank goodness for surgeons who can do this. They turn something into an object. They look at it unemotionally and they fix it. Uh, so they look at things. Artists tend to look from the inside of things. They describe and, and um, visualize the interiors, not the exteriors. So we need both of these capacities. We need culture and the arts, and we need these beautiful people who turn things into objects, subjects and objects. So people are beginning to resurrect the value of the subjective. And because uh, artists have always been devalued sadly but that has been their job and I would love to just spend this little time looking at at the object subject split through the artist's eyes um, because it's so important um, what happens when you make art for example fiction which speaks from the inside of the person they find the they often use the pronoun I and they express the interiors of people or nonfiction, which looks at the outside of things, studies them, analyzes them. It or its is the way you get a PhD. Got to be able to do that. So there's these two ways of being, two ways of knowing, quantitative, qualitative, both essential. And we're bringing these together now. That's the new integration of the yin and the yang. So I'd like to describe a real situation where this happened. My research happens to be specifically focused on how creativity does transform us. You know, people like Wilbur and Keegan said transformation was moving the subjective to the objective. Well, my research shows the opposite is equally transformative, which is turning the objective into the subjective. And this has been ignored. By great thinkers. So Jen and I, you want to, you and I want to resurrect this path of the binary that's been devalued. So my research took me to a little village in Africa. And I want to describe how this happens, where we turn the objective into the subjective and how transformative this is. Um, I went to live in a little village to do an art therapy research where the folks were suffering from a pandemic, the HIV pandemic. There was a great suffering in the village. 
And they were really immersed at first and not sideways by this terrible event that took a third of the village. Every weekend they were spent burying tens of people who died that week. Um, before the science caught up and before, this was the early 2000s, before they understood the nature of the virus, before they were antiretrovirals, the subjective experience was just massive. And there was a lot of depression and overwhelm and nobody knew really what was going on. They didn't realize it was sexually transmitted and uh, people were dying. There was a lot of grief. So this village turned to art making. They turned the subject of overwhelm into images and they're the most moving images. It was a profound experience to go and see how despite being ill and weak and poverty stricken, this village found the creative resources to turn their story into gloriously beautiful objects. So then they began to get a distance from it and they could see the experience. These gorgeous wall panels that were embroidered told the story of the suffering. They began to get a spacious distance from the event and they could see what had happened. And then there was conversation was generated. The words began to come. So the healing was let's now articulate what we see, there's the object and we've got a dialogue and discourse. So we're getting some separation and we can see what happened to us and now we can move forward and deal with it. Not only that, they took these beautiful works of art around to other villages so that those discourses could happen. And the whole, as you and I have discussed, Jen, the transformation was from the individual to the community, to the villages around, to the whole country. Now these glorious pieces of work travel all around the world, showing how we can transform the wound into magic and understanding. But let's just look at this. The subjective experience of the community was made object. Object traveled to other villages and inspired subjective experience. Suddenly other villages could feel that, could grieve, could understand. So the piece of art that was the object stimulated subjective experience. Other people without HIV could begin to feel and empathize. The whole world began to feel and empathize and funding came and then there was a clinic and then there was antiretrovirals. And so that work of art which was an object, stimulated subjective experience. And there was empathy. These things cannot be separated. They're two sides of the same coin. When we only see one side or the other, it's pathological. When we can do both and notice that these things are fractal patterns and fields of resonance, and we can enter the non-duality of bringing these splits together. It's not only personal, it's community as well. It's cultural as well. This thing is a field of resonance. So healing the split within can only heal the split without. And creativity is one of the main mechanisms for this. And we're gonna focus a couple of episodes just on that. So I'm gonna leave it there, Jen, and um, I'll say goodbye to everybody in a minute, but I'd love to ask you for your further words on this. It's so important we bring this lens of culture and um, of that this knowledge um, and this phenomenon of, of creative transformation is not in nothing new. And the, the humility that we feel, um, you know, just even saying this, um, you know, we, we're humble in our awareness that we're not seeing anything that's novel. We're just pointing out how this moves in our world and has been you know, moving throughout our world uh, historically. Um, it's, it's what a, I'm just so touched by, um, by the story you shared and, and how important it is, even what we're doing here in this podcast is, 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 is this in the same 
vein, right? Because we're using our creativity and, and we're sharing the, our own experiences and our stories and our knowledge in a way that reflects out into the world. And suddenly somebody listening has a resonance, just like the people in the villages we're having a resonance and we're transformed we are doing that here and that's a beautiful thing I, I'm just so proud and excited to use this um, medium of communication to 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 not just speak about transformation but instigate transformation as well um, so I'd like to um, end with a quote from Adi Ashanti who's come up a couple of times in our podcast uh, he says, meditative self-inquiry is the art of asking a spiritually powerful question. And a question that is spiritually powerful always points us back to ourselves. Because the most important thing that leads to spiritual awakening is to discover who and what we are. To wake up from this dream state, this trance state of identification, and for this awakening to occur, there needs to be some transformative energy that can flash into consciousness. It needs to be an energy that is powerful enough to awaken consciousness out of its trance into the truth of our being. Inquiry is an active engagement with our own experience that can cultivate this flash of spiritual insight. And I just love that because I think that's what we're doing here. We're cultivating those flash of insights that will perhaps encourage anyone listening to this to start engaging and participating with your own mind and with your inner world. Take an interest in developing intimacy within yourself so that you, if you haven't already, can cultivate this shift of perception and find that space between your thoughts. And when you find that space, I want you to focus on it and study those patterns of feelings, of mind, of thought, so that you can become aware of yourself as the conscious witness and observer of your thoughts, feelings, and thinking, as opposed to being swept up in that rushing river of thoughts and thinking and feelings. And if you have any questions, or Sally and I can support you on that inner journey, I hope you'll reach out to us on our website, which is radicalemergence.org. And also um, we have a Facebook group called We Are Our Own Best Friends. And that's a kind and supportive community where we wanna welcome you as we explore ways to build intimacy within ourselves. All right, Sally, I'm gonna pass it back to you for closing us up. Yeah, Jen, you mentioned flashes of insight. Um, that's how things begin to shift and they're incredible when they arrive. However, the flash of insight can become a cultivated state through the practices that we have talked about. So practicing meditation is one huge way to turn the flash of insight into a state that you can cultivate. And with enough cultivation, the state becomes a permanent structure of consciousness called a stage. And we're gonna do another episode on stages. So this is amazing. Those little flashes of insight become states that you can cultivate where feelings and thoughts are witnessed. And then they become stages, permanent structures where we live in the witness conscious. So arts and sciences and self come together in this beautiful unitative consciousness that is non-duality. And so I would love to end with honoring the culture that first taught me this, which is Hinduism, the great, great culture of India that wrote so many beautiful scripts around the state that becomes a stage of unity. Um, and I'd just like to mention that in their culture, Shiva can transform into all sorts of personifications. He's the God of transformation. And in the one personification, he's Nataraja, the dancer. You, you've seen pictures of him in a circle and he's dancing, holding the world up as the dancer, Nataraja. Nataraja means, well, Raja means meaning, 
Nata means the dancer. So this image of you achieve Shiva consciousness when the, the dancer and the dance merge. There's no subject object split. Be the unitative consciousness. He is the dancer of the universe that's constantly transforming. And when the dancer and the dance are no longer separate, the object subject becomes your identity. That is unitative consciousness, non-duality. So that metaphor lives supreme for me and I uh, wanna honor that culture right now and all the cultures that are exploring this in their own ways, shamanism, animism, um, and the West that stood out of that for a while to do its amazing accomplishments and now we're rediscovering the wisdom. So everybody, I just wanted to take a minute to thank you all if you're here with us and sharing this journey. And um, Jen and I are so excited to be with you and share this and try to articulate the great wisdoms. What an experience that is for you and I, Jen, transformative. Um, so next week, we're going to take this even further. We're going to look at how the subject object works together, how we merge and emerge as a fluid dance, the Nataraja, where we can do both. We can merge and emerge the yin and the yang of identity. So until then, take great care of yourselves and we look forward to being with you again two weeks time. Bye-bye. So thanks for joining us. And we hope you can take away some helpful tools, perhaps some great stories, and some wisdom for your own ongoing journey. Join us for our next episode, where we will deep dive again into a universe of transformation.